as we have just discussed in the last class that oxidation kinetics is the most important part because that basically tells us how to quantify the life and durability of the component. So, how these kinetics are measured? The simplest possible way of uh, measuring kinetics is uh, maybe visual, you know when you see a component, it does not look the way it is. So, you can say it has been oxidized or, but that is not the quantitative method. So, the only quantitative method is the gravimetric method and you understand what is the meaning of gravimetric? Anything based upon the mass change or weight change measurements. Now, when a metal is exposed to say oxygen environment, it forms oxide and as a result of this the metal absorbs oxygen reacts it with the metal and form a oxide and in this process basically it is trying to gain weight in terms of the extra oxygen which has reacted with the metal and this results in the weight change and this is the simplest way of measuring oxidation. Now, in usual ways what we do is that we just take a sample of a particular size and dimension, take its initial weight and put it in a furnace and then after say 10 hours, 30 hours, 50 hours we remove it, reweigh it and that difference of the weight from this sample versus the original sample will give you basically the amount of oxygen that has been reacted with the metal. Now, if I have to find the kinetics, then I cannot find the kinetics just by one reading. So, we have to carry out the test for various times. That is, we have kept the sample taken after say 50 hours, measure the weight change, then we keep it again, again after 50 hours we take another weight, then after 100 hours, after 150 hours and so on and so forth. Now, if we plot this weight change versus time, we get a linear curve and from this linear curve we can get the kinetics. This is the most simplest way where you need only a normal furnace and an electronic balance by which you can measure the kinetics. But what is the biggest drawback of this method is that every time you have to cool, remove the sample, wait again bring it back to the furnace, again heat it. So, this method is known as a discontinuous method of kinetics measurement and in many a ways this does not give you the true representation of a isothermal oxidation. So, it is basically a cyclic kind of oxidation where we measure each weight change after proper cooling and then weighing it and then keeping it again in the furnace. That is why this method is not bad, this method is not wrong, but it is not the true representation of isothermal oxidation. So, if I want to measure the isothermal oxidation, then I must get the weight changes as a function of time in a continuous manner. 
without stopping the furnace, removing the sample and this method is known as thermogravimetry. So, we have added the word thermo to the gravimetric method and what does it mean? The change in weight as a function of temperature or you can say the other way, the change in weight as a function of time at a particular temperature. The change in weight with temperature is known as thermogravimetry and this is the most uh, common technique which is used to measure lots of data for uh, various materials. If you want to find temperature stability of a powder, temperature stability of a material, how it interacts at various temperature, then simply carry out a thermogravity test from 0 to whatever temperature you want, it will tell you what kind of losses it, uh, it occurs at various temperatures and that can be interpreted in terms of the deterioration which is taking place at various temperature. For example, if you take uh, uh, copper sulphate 5 H2O, copper sulphate crystals and if you take it thermogravimetry, then what you will get? That when you start heating it, that at a particular temperature, there will be a sudden that loss will be of evaporation of water and it takes in two steps. In first step, two water molecules are gone and in the second step, three water molecules are gone and then it becomes anhydrous copper sulphate. So, this is the simple way in which you can just see a thermogravity curve in which you can find the, the weight loss will give you some information about the changes taking place in say copper sulphate powder. If you see lots of chemistry related activities, PG thermogravimetry is the important part. If you want to find any kind of a phase transformation, if you want to find any kind of decomposition most of the things can be found out by there is another very important technique of thermal analysis and that is DTA. DTA is differential thermal analysis. The only difference in that is here we measure the change in temperature as a function of temperature. What, what is the meaning of that? It is based upon a very simple theory that any chemical reaction which occurs it is either endothermic or so, if you plot, if a, if a reaction A plus B is going to form C, then it can be either endothermic or exothermic. If it is endothermic, it is trying to take heat from the system. So, there will be a, the change in temperature will be negative. And if it is an exothermic reaction, then the heat is evolved and the system will get more heat and the peak will be there into that. So, there we actually plot is in terms of delta T as a function of temperature of the system and usually we get these two peaks indicate two different kind of changes taking place in the system. Third important technique is DSC. Now, DSC is differential scanning calorimetry. Uh, what is the difference between DSC and DTA? In DTA, we are converting the heat signal into temperature. 
while in DSC we measure direct heat change in terms of energy, in terms of voltage change which is equivalent to the heat generated. So, basically both these processes are same, it is only the accuracy wise they are different into that. So, DSC is considered to be more accurate process than that. And these are the three important uh, differential uh, thermal analysis techniques which are very much used for a uh, lot of uh, chemical application. There is another technique based upon the thermal analysis is dilatometry. What is dilatometry? Here the change in dimension as a function of temperature is plotted. Now, many materials expand on heating. So, if you systematically measure the change in length of a component as a function of temperature, you will get the kinetics in terms of the change in dimension as a function of this. So, this is called dilatometry and this is again a very powerful technique and as a matter of fact, this principle is also used to measure so many, I mean this can be used as a sensor for many components. You know, if you know what is piezoelectric material, in piezoelectric material you use certain kind of a ceramics which change in, which result in the change in dimension when some kind of waves hit onto them. So, this principle is used to uh, measure lots of uh, um, uh, important uh, information from this kind of a principle. So, this was just as a passing remark that thermal analysis is a very important branch which gives the information of many important properties which change as a function of temperature. Physical properties like we told mass, then it is thermogrammetry, temperature or heat, then it is DTA or DSC, change in dimension, then it is dilatometry and so on and so forth. But in high temperature oxidation, we are more bothered about the change in mass or change in weight as a function of uh, temperature as well as for isothermal condition change in weight as a function of time at a particular temperature and which gives us the isothermal conditions. Now, simple way to show what is the meaning of a thermogrammetry. Uh, you can see on the, in this diagram on the top we have a simple micro balance. It is the same balance which we use in our lab. It is a bottom loading balance in which one arm is taking care of the weight and on the other arm we are trying to measure the weights. Now, what we have simply changed is that instead of keeping a pan over that, we have created a hook at the bottom of this thing and on this hook using a platinum wire, we finally suspend a specimen and then around this we create a chamber in which we can carry out oxidation in oxygen or air or any other gases and that is surrounded by a sensitive furnace. Now, how the weight change is measured continuously? Now, just imagine I am heating this furnace at say 500 degree centigrade and there is a steel sample and as initially it absorbs oxygen and then it forms very small amount of oxide and moment it forms an oxide, there is a weight change on this side of the furnace or the, this side of the balance due to the oxygen absorbed or the oxide formed. Now, in mechanical balances, this was usually done that whatever weight change occurs, then automatically there is a mechanical system which will balance that amount of weight from a reservoir of various weights lying next to that. They will just put it into that, it will balance and that will be registered. But the most uh, latest balances are electronic balances. And these electronic balances, the principle is totally different. There what they do is that whatever small weight change that occurs on the this side of the balance 
and as a result of that if my balance beam slightly tilts like that, this tilting process is immediately checked by some kind of a sensor, optical sensor and this optical sensor then immediately sends a signal here and try to create a torque which tries to balance the change in the horizontalness which has taken place and which in turn is equivalent to some amount of voltage which is required to bring back that. So, this change of weight very small weight uh, change, uh, change of weight which has taken place is converted into that kind of a voltage signal which is recorded at that particular time. And as the weight change occurs this process continues and works in this fashion. Now, this is the most common principle which is usually applied in most of the thermogrammetic balances and that is why in this kind of a balance you have not to stop or carry out the heating again and again or any kind of things the weight change is measured automatically. So, there is a printer and computer attached along with that and that gives you the measurement of this thing continuously. So, this was the simple way another very nice way to show the continuous wave me measurement is known as by spring balance. Now, these are not the normal springs these are very very sensitive quartz springs. The main properties of these springs are that that they can show the elongation even with the slightest possible weight change of microgram level. So, the principle of this uh, thing is that if I take a sensitive spring like this and on that I load my sample in the same way as I have shown in the previous uh, slide then as the oxidation occurs there is a change in the length of the spring and this will go on changing as the weight change occurs. So, how you carry out this whole test? What you do is that you just try to uh, initially when you hang the sample suppose your position it is at this point that is the 0 position when I have not started any heating. So, that position is marked as the 0 position and with a very sensitive cathetometer you keep on measuring the change that is happening. What is a cathetometer? It is just like a telescope which has a scale onto that and you put your 0 position exactly into that and as the heating occurs this 0 position will go on changing. So, initially what you do these spring balances have to be calibrated in the sense that suppose there is a change of 1 milligram. So, for 1 milligram the change is say 0.1 mm then it changed to 5 mm the change is 0.3 mm something like that. So, there you make a plot of the linear change versus weight that is your standard thing into that and now when you when the oxidation is occurring you are finding the change in length and that change in length is corresponding to particular weight change and this is the most simplest experiment which initially when these thermo balances were not available people used to measure the weight change by this kind of sophisticated methods. Now, I am showing you the uh, most sophisticated balance which is a complete uh, balance for a research kind of activity which we people try to do. Now, this is basically a top loading balance where you see this is the housing of the balance this is the main housing of the balance and here you see the electronic balance and this is the uh, horizontal beam and on the right side of the uh, of this you have loaded the sample here and over that you have the chamber and then there is a furnace around that. Okay. So, this is the one part of the balance. Now, the second part of the balance is you see at the bottom of this thing it is attached to various kinds of pumps. Yesterday I told you rotary pump for 10 to minus 3 diffusion pump for 10 to minus 6. So, this equipment is loaded with both rotary pump as well as diffusion pumps. So, that you can work at any pressure ranging from 10 to minus 3 to 10 to minus 6 that is one aspect of that. And then you will see here next to that there is a needle wall connected to gas system. So, this is the gas cylinder it can be oxygen it can be hydrogen it can be nitrogen it can be 
chlorine or any kind of gas into that. So, these gases are cleaned together and after cleaning they are sent into this so that the oxidation should be carried out in a particular environment. And then I, I, I think this is not shown here and on that side of this thing you have sophisticated computers attached to that which automatically measures the weight change as a function of temperature and any other kind of things which are required to be measured. Why this is a very important research tool? People want to know, okay, I have kept the sample here, put it in gas, it forms oxide, but what is the mechanism? What is really happening at the initial time when metal is exposed to oxygen? What kind of changes are occurring in the gas system? So, you find that here even the gas system which is there that is picked up and then it is sent to maybe a evolved gas analysis or a chromatography or to any other system where you can analyze the gas system here to really understand the mechanism of that. This was the kind of a system I purchased long back when I was in atomic energy in 1982 and uh, this was perhaps the last few uh, equipment we purchased from Switzerland. Now these kind of equipments are not available. Now they are more compact equipments and what you will see in our lab, uh, we have uh, very sophisticated uh, equipment where we can carry out the oxidation from temperatures as high as 1000 degree centigrade one system and 1500 degree centigrade second system. So, those systems are much more compact, but they have all these facilities which, which, are, which are there in this kind of a system. So, in general if you talk about a thermal balance, what are the three important uh, uh, parts of this? One is the balance itself, sensitivity of a balance, how accurately you can measure the weight change. That is why the balances are uh, divided into micro balance. Micro balance means with a sensitivity of 1 microgram semi micro balance with a sensitivity of around 1 mm up, up 0.1 mm or so. So, like that you uh, divide the various balances into that. So, electronics of the balance is the most important part there and its measurement methods attached to a computer interface. But the most important part of the balance is the furnace. Now, here I will spend some time on various kinds of furnaces and today uh, I will request all of you to visit our basement lab which is which can which is housing perhaps the most sophisticated normal furnaces. So, what, what is basically a furnace? You can say furnace is nothing but something where a material is heated or which can create a temperature more than the normal temperature. So, I, I, I always want a precise answer, quick and precise answer. So, a furnace if you have to define is, a furnace is a, an equipment which helps to create a temperature, I will say more than better than room temperature to as high as 1000 degree, 5, uh, 2000 degree and so on and so forth. Now, how this heating process occurs? Okay, this is one method which is called resistance heating, but in general heating can be carried out by various methods, heating coal, uh, burning a gas, which, I mean, these are very common furnaces which are being used, but for many of these research application we use what is known as electric furnaces and again this electric furnaces work on two principles, one is the resistance heating, other is the radiation heating. Resistance heating is that in which a particular filament of uh, 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 wire is heated, when we pass current into that based upon its resistance it creates a suitable temperature. Other is called the radiation heatings where we add uh, 
materials like silicon rods and they are heated very strongly and they radiate heat and work onto that. And third is the induction uh, heating methods where we create the heat by putting a current into a coil and in the center of these things you create uh, a high temperature. So, these are the three basic methods by which you cre uh, create very sophisticated furnaces. Now, again I will ask suppose the most important part of the furnace is first is the heating element when we talk about electric furnaces and the temperature which we want to achieve. Now, again there are three categories one is room temperature to 900 degree centigrade, second is room temperature to 1600 degree centigrade and third is up to 2400 degree centigrade. Now, I want to know what are the various materials which are used for such application. Nichrome, there is simple nic uh, uh, nickel chromium alloy which has a limit of 900 degree centigrade and beyond that it start getting oxidized. So, this is the simplest furnaces which can go from 0 to 900 degree centigrade. So, when you have to go for 1200 to 1600 degree centigrade what you do? Next kind of things are canthol. Now, I think this is this is will be the you know later on when we study the alloy oxidation this is what you will learn. When you go for nickel base alloy with nickel chromium aluminum then you can go for temperatures as high as 1200 degree centigrade. So, if you take canthol as a heating element you can go up to 1200 degree centigrade, third is 1600 degree centigrade. If you have to go for 1600 degree centigrade then either you can go for uh, uh, what is called super canthol, super canthol is nothing but molybdenum silicide MOS2 uh, MOSI2. So, these are the uh, uh, things which are used as the heating elements up to 1600 degree centigrade, but if you have to go beyond 1600 degree centigrade to 2400 degree centigrade the only way is heating elements like platinum, uh, a, a tungsten, a tantalum these are the heating elements even molybdenum something, but the most common one used is the tungsten heating elements. Now, the biggest problem of these heating elements is that they have a very good high temperature properties, but they oxidize and form volatile oxides. So, in order to protect that these furnaces work only in protected environment. Protected environment means either in vacuum or in highly inert gases like argon or helium and that limits the use of these things for particular application. Okay. So, what we have discussed is nichrome, canthal, super canthal, tungsten uh, uh, heating, ele heating elements or silicon rods as a radiation heatings. Now, the next important point is in terms of temperature measurement. Again for temperature measurement similar kind of uh, degrees are there up to 900 degree centigrade you can measure by simple nichrome uh, uh, what is called copper constant uh, constant uh, 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 thermocouples, but first I want to know what is the thermocouple Seebeck effect. So, what is the Seebeck effect that you create a you, you take two different uh, metals and create their uh, weld, weld those kind of things together and then one of these thing you put it in a lower temperature or we can say a reference temperature which is fixed and other is the temperature which you are trying to measure. 
So the principle of this thing is that that if you put such kind of a couple in two different temperature, the uh, difference of that will give you the exact temperature at uh, um, uh, the, 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 the exact temperature which you want to measure. Now, this effect is uh, uh, basically on the basis of uh, the two different metals which are, uh, I, 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 I do not remember how, how you calculate the, uh, these kind of things, but the Seebeck effect is the effect which is used to measure this. Now, what, what, what is the basic requirement? There should be a couple of two different metals. Now, as I told you copper constant, these are used up to 900 degree centigrade. Uh, from 900 to uh, 1600 degree centigrade, we mostly use platinum, platinum, rhodium. And from 1600 to 2400 degree centigrade, we have a tungsten, tungsten, rhenium. Okay. Now, all these things I am just trying to tell you that these are again some kind of a IQ questions. When you are studying a course on high temperature oxidation, then you must know at least what is the functions of the various kinds of things, how high temperature thing is measured, how, how temperature uh, high temperature is created what are the materials used, what are the furnace used. I think these are the basic things which are required to be known to you. So, many a times you find you know what is high temperature oxidation, what are his theories, but you do not know how to measure high temperature. Another important part of the furnace is the temperature control. You see, if you just take a resistance wire and start uh, adding uh, current into that, it will go on increasing the temperature. But you want a fixed temperature, so how to get a fixed temperature? And for this we have to measure various kinds of control methods. What is a control method? Like suppose I want to uh, reach a temperature of say 500 degree centigrade and I use a resistance wire. So, if I just put it like that, the temperature will go on increasing and finally, since there is no limit, finally it will break. So, what we do is that, suppose I want to make a temperature of, uh, uh, of 500 degree centigrade, I try to put a limit. So, moment it reaches 500 degree centigrade, I create a relay and that as it reaches 500 degree centigrade, the relay will work and it will break the current circuit and it will start cooling. And then when it comes below 500, again the relay will get on and this is known as a simple control method, where the temperature uh, sensitivity will be from 5 degree to 10 degree or so, so it is not very, very accurate. Then we have another method like proportional controller. A proportional control is that in which like I put a uh, thing of 500 degree centigrade as the uh, temperature limit. Now, what it does is proportional control is that it does not depend upon the difference in temperature, but it depends upon the heat that is uh, uh, it is away from that temperature. For example, at 500 degree centigrade, if I require x amount of heat or x amount of uh, current or resistance, then I, as it goes down, I control that resistance that as the resistance of this thing goes below this, it immediately makes it on and works on. It does not wait for the temperature, it, does, it waits for the heat difference between that point to that. And there is another one PID control, which I do not know the mechanism, electronic people know much better than that. So, these are various kinds of mechanism by which today we can control temperatures between plus minus 0.1 degree or so. So, this is how the sensitive uh, kind of things are uh, uh, 
uh, really made and again not part of your course, but from general knowledge point of view, I will again go to Google, go offer all these kind of things. You know why I want to this uh, thing, uh, uh, you, uh, to know these kind of things that somewhere somebody asked this question to you, oh you are working in high temperature, can you tell me how you control this temperature? Can you tell me various mechanism of heating the system? Can you tell me how I can go to 2400 degree centigrade? What is the maximum temperature I can go to with a furnace? I think these are general questions which are more important than many a times even the what is the theory of high temperature oxidation. So these are the things which I want that uh, and, and today I have not to give a feedback to you. Maybe some of the things I may not be knowing, but just open Google or go to library, there are various books, we can just look into that. And I, if you are not going into that uh, profession, there is no need of going into every bit of detail. But if gather at least that much of information, so that you can confidently talk to any other person, what is the meaning of these terms? I think that at least is very, very important. So I. Uh, uh, every time I make a special request to you that if you want to substantiate what is taught in the class to what you really want to gain, then you have to do that kind of work. Then you have to really go into these kind of details and know all these things which will be much easier for you to understand the whole scenario of this subject in a much better way. Okay. Now, in, in this thing there was a also a very important uh, things which we uh, again carried out a lot of work into that. You talk about power plants, in power plants we heat water, finally it converts into steam. So basically if you see it is the steam oxidation which is causing a serious problem to the components of the turbine and other part. So we just told I can oxidize a material in oxygen, oxygen plus nitrogen, hydrogen and so many kind of things. But if I have to carry out the test in steam, how will I carry out? You know, one simple method of carrying out test in steam is you go to our labs, we have autoclaves. What is the autoclave? Instrument where you can sustain high temperature and high pressure, where you can sustain high temperature and high pressure. Now, in this kind of a system, like I am just uh, telling you, you cannot go for high pressure very much. Like for example, when we convert uh, uh, water into steam, we sustain very high pressures and these sensitive balances you cannot just work on to that. So lots of steam work is usually done in autoclaves. So in autoclaves, we can go to a temperature of uh, up to 170, I even in our system we can go up to 200 degree centigrade or so. So with that you can create steam environment and you can suspend your samples and then study their behavior in steam. But the only limitation of those autoclave is that you are trying to see how a material behaves, you have kept in the beginning and after the end of the test maybe 100 hours or 200 hours or whatever it is. So you are trying to find out in 100 hours what has happened either by weight change or by physically seeing the specimen. But what we are talking about, if you have to carry out thermogravimetry test in steam, how will you carry out? I think this is the only company, Metler is the only company who could make this very nice system. So it is the same system I told you in the, showed you in the previous slide. This is the balance part. The only change you see is there in the, the furnace part. So what, what actually they did was the sample uh, exposition is exactly same. But after that what they have done is that they have put a uh, uh, quartz chamber and in this quartz chamber there is a coil and that coil gives the heat. And now outside in this uh, area you create the steam and then steam is passed through this system 
by a carrier gas like nitrogen. So, it comes here and creates a steam here. Now, the problem is that if you take the steam like this, the steam may enter into the balance and will corrode the balance. So, what do you do is that you pass an another gas from the if you see in the previous thing from this area, from this area you pass another gas which is heavier than nitrogen. So, that it will not allow steam to come into the chamber and moment steam comes up to this point, at this point it just gets changed into water and then removed from this side. So, this is a very nice system by which you can carry out the oxidation studies in steam. And uh, I think we were uh, uh, first few people who used these furnaces and generated a lot of data for the uh, uh, steam turbine material. Otherwise, the only way you can carry out test in like uh, air and water vapor, oxygen and water vapor. How you do this test? You take these gases and pass it through a hot reservoir and depending upon the temperature, you can see the steam curves, depending upon the temperature the gas picks up the water and becomes saturated with that much percentage of that. So, I think uh, in our lab we have been carrying out uh, lots of commercial work which uh, uh, Narayan has carried out for BHEL and other kind of things, where we control 2 percent of vapor, water vapors, 5 percent of va water vapors. So, based upon that we saturate the gas with that percent of water vapors and that we pass into that. So, again we are doing this test uh, mostly in the uh, uh, what is known as a discontinuous method, but not in the continuous method. So, continuous method where you have to safeguard a furnace which is uh, which is so costly equipment you have to carry out in this particular ways. Uh, there are another very sophisticated furnaces available where you carry out the test in a symmetrical manner. You know one of the biggest problem when you carry out the thermography test is when you hang a specimen like this and measure the weight change. The biggest problem is the buoyancy effect. And buoyancy effect is there because you have two heads of the balance, one is just holding the weights and other is hanging the specimen. So, there is no symmetry into that. So, the company like Setaram made very sophisticated balances which are called symmetrical balances. In this what they did was that both uh, uh, balance heads one is carrying the sample and other is carrying the same size of the inert sample like platinum or any kind of thing as a reference thing. So, if you do like that the buoyancy effects are eliminated and you can get uh, the uh, data which is free from buoyancy. As such when the weight changes are very high the buoyancy does not affect, but if you are measuring weight changes in the level of micro microgram or uh, semi micrograms. In that case uh, uh, buoyancy plays a very important role and you have to eliminate it by making symmetrical furnaces like that, where the effect of the sample uh, buoyancy should be taken care by the reference sample on the uh, other pan industrial examples where many of the heating is not carried out in um, electric furnaces. Heating is carried out by burning the gases or by any other kind of things or even if you see uh, our power plants where heat is created by burning coal or burning coal and gas or in many cases we use what is known as uh, what is called uh, burner oil kind of things very uh, uh, relatively cheaper kind of a fuel which create lots of impurities into that. Burner rig is a is a kind of a very sophisticated uh, system where you can create heatings by various methods. 
you can introduce various kinds of impurities. If you want to create some kind of eroding medium into that, you can add sand or something like that. So, burner rig are the experiments which are carried out only to simulate the exact industry conditions. For example, if you want to uh, simulate the coal burning conditions in a, uh, a thermal power plant, you can simulate all those conditions in such kind of thing. So, so what we can say is that burner rig is a is a uh, experimental arena where you can control various parameters and simulate them exactly as per the requirement of a industry. Thermogrammetric balance is another kind of things they do not they cannot simulate all these kind of things. So, they only give you basic data which can give you the kinetics of the process, but the variations which are there into that it they are really not possible in many of these uh, sophisticated furnaces. So, for that we have to carry out on these kind of things. What, are, what can be the other methods of measuring oxidation? See in, in, in whatever method we have discussed thermogrammetry, what we are trying to do? We are trying to measure the weight change. I slightly indicated to in that system that suppose there is a gas, oxygen gas passing say 10 is to power minus 2 atmosphere with the oxygen. So, when it reacts immediately part of the oxygen around the specimen has been reduced. So, why my methods are based upon only weight change, why I cannot measure change in oxidation by measuring the gas pressure change. And this is a method using oxygen sensors, we can measure very, very sensitive oxidation process. What are oxygen sensors? As the name suggests, oxygen sensor is nothing but which can sense the availability or non availability of oxygen. Means, any change in the oxygen concentration in a system can be detected by that, that is called oxygen sensor. So, what are these oxygen sensors? YSZ, what is YSZ? Yttria stabilized zirconia. Okay, I will just tell you the background. In general, many of the ceramics they are sensitive to oxygen. Now, this sensitivity can be enhanced instead of taking pure zirconia, if you can add around 8 percent of yttria into that, it becomes yttria stabilized zirconia. Now, this kind of a system is very, very sensitive to very, very small level of oxygen. Okay. Now, what you do is that, now you make a so called electrochemical cell and in this electrochemical cell, we have a platinum as two electrodes and on one side you can keep a constant oxygen source and on second side you can put your oxidizing system like iron reacting with oxygen. Now, what you do is that now you take this system and pass as I told you say very small amount of oxygen say 10 to minus 2 suppose at a temperature of 700 degree centigrade as soon as the metal comes in contact with this oxygen, it will form oxide and immediately there will be change in the partial pressure of oxygen and this partial pressure of oxygen was it will be immediately detected by these sensors and it will give that with time. Now, I am measuring the change in partial pressure of oxygen as a function of time, which in turn will give me the kinetics of oxidation, but these equipments are not. Uh, uh, used for measuring kinetics, but these instruments are basically used to detect even the smallest amount of oxidation which is occurring under that. Okay. So, that is the significance in which I just want to tell you. I think two more techniques and then we will end. Ellipsometric technique, uh, we have a very nice ellipsometer in the SAF sophisticated instrument uh, lab. Now, ellipsometer is basically nothing but it is a optical microscope. The only difference is that in optical microscope, we use a monochromatic beam, non polarized monochromatic beam we use, but if you divide this light into if you polarize this light, then it has two components, phase change and uh, uh, 
in these two planes, it tries to divide it. So, so if I pass the polarized light, when I pass a normal optical light, it simply gets reflected. But when I pass a polarized light, then this polarized light reflection will change depending upon the refractive index of the surface film. Now, as the thickness grows, the refractive index changes, and that gives the change in the phase angles of the polarized light. Again, this kind of techniques are for very, very light oxidation things like I told you logarithmic range. The oxidation which occurs in the logarithmic range is not studied by thermogrammetry, but by this kind of methods. What is happening in the initial stages of oxidation, those kind of things are studied by the uh, ellipsometric method. So, basically what I am trying to say is that when you use polarized light in place of the non polarized light, then it gives a change in the phase angles as it falls or as the thickness of the oxide grows and this helps you to measure the oxidation process this manner. Now, a simple anodization process, anodization process is what? When you carry out electrochemical test, the oxygen from the system is picked up by the metal like aluminum and it forms an oxide. Now, how much oxygen is picked up will depend upon how much current you pass. So, by this way you can measure the amount of oxygen consumed or used by the anode and that will give you the oxidation behavior. And the last one is interference colors. Have you ever seen if you want to do this test you can just do this test take any steel or stainless steel sample and put it in the flame and then you go on seeing what kind of color change occurs. You will see you will at first you will get a very fine nice bluish tinge and this bluish tinge goes on becoming slightly stronger and stronger it becomes dark blue and then it changes to grey and finally it changes to black. Now, what are these kind of things? These are nothing but the change is occurring based upon the thickness of the film. Initially when the, the film is very very thin it has a light bluish color and as it goes thicker it becomes dark bluish finally grey and, and finally to the black and these are the change in colors which happens which changes into the simple way to see that uh, as the thickness changes your optical light interference with that also changes and hence the color change. So, very simple way to estimate what is really happening to my sample either in a tarnishing way or the thin oxide which are formed under that. So, this uh, basically is uh, was a kind of recipe I wanted to give you on um, uh, the oxidation measurement. Uh, lots of things here are from understanding point of view, really learning the basic principles how this thing happens and an overall knowledge about uh, a gamut of uh, method of methods which are used to uh, uh, I will say detect oxidation, uh, view oxidation or quantitatively measured into that. So, that is what you have to take into that and uh, try to uh, uh, substantiate your uh, further knowledge by going into details by uh, reading into various books or some of the information on furnaces, uh, control methods and materials used for these things. You please try to enhance your knowledge by uh, going to internet and uh, proper books to en enhance that.